The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Let's pray. My favorite scripture, and I shared last week why it's my favorite scripture. He who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. Right? If he began something in you, he will continue it. That was my, one of my first supernatural experiences, running into a man of God who basically gave me that as the word of the Lord for my life, that the rest of your life will be a God story. It's not a dentist story. It's a God story. You enter into the God story. All of you can enter into the God story for yourselves, all right? Okay, so today I'm going to go slow and granular so that we have a foundation to equip others. Are you ready? This is, this is for you to kind of like the surgeons. See one, do one, teach one. So this message today is going to be one that you're going to hear with your ears, but you're going to apply it by practicing it on someone else. Okay? All right. So basically this message is going to be who is doing the forgiving? Who is doing the forgiving? All right? That's just your title. Um, Before we begin in that, do you realize that Luke 24... And John 20, go preach the forgiveness of sin. Go preach the remission of sin. This is, that's a commandment. But you're going to preach something. You need to live something that you're preaching, correct? Otherwise, you're talking out of two sides of your mouth. All right? So preach the remission of sin is a mandate. It's actually the, the love message where the rubber meets the road. When you walk in a lifestyle of supernatural forgiveness, you're basically walking in the love message of Jesus. Tough love. But... I came across an article about survivors. Now, this is a secular article. You know that there are people that under extremely difficult situations somehow rose above poverty, uh, physical impairments, and rose above and really made something of themselves in life. And the term they use loosely is survivors. I say there's a counterpart part in the in the church called overcomers, and we want to get there. But just understanding a survivor, what what did these people do to become a survivor? Somehow, regardless of the circumstances against them, they found a way to let certain things go and not let it stop them, crush them, and get them to just go into despair. Somehow. They rose above it. Somehow, without Jesus, they learned to release and let it go. I actually believe my father was like that. I don't recall my father ever having an enemy or ever speaking bad of anybody. Uh, My mother had the discernment, though. She would tell my dad, "Uh, you better watch out that guy that works in the microfilm department. And my dad would go, how do you know? You don't even work there. Sure enough, the guy in the microfilm department was doing something borderline uh, theft, whatever it was that he was doing, but somehow she always had the discernment to know this is prior to salvation. She was, she was people-wise, street-wise, I guess you would call it. But my dad, regardless of the circumstances, somehow learned that, in his opinion, he never had an enemy. That's a nice way to live, isn't it? And quite frankly, even before he was saved, he was the best example I ever had of how to love a woman. He was a good, good husband to my mother. And uh, as a matter of fact, the only time I ever saw my dad in really bad torment was when my mom was delirious and she was on her deathbed and she was saying things that didn't make sense. Like, you know, Lloyd, take the dog out. Well, we, uh, we don't have a dog. But he actually got frustrated because he was so used to doing to please her that when it was something that was impossible to do, he got all shook up. I had to have another pastor 
because I was, I'm his kid. You don't, you don't listen to your kid. You're always a kid. I have to have another pastor call and tell him how to behave. <laughs> you know? So my, it was so funny. The pastor says, Lloyd, you've just got to make a, make a joke about it. She's delirious. Just love on her like you've always loved on her, but don't, don't expect to do the thing she's asking because they, we, they don't make sense. He said, I had to go through this with my father, and, and you know, you can do it. So, so <laughs> my dad walks in the bedroom, and he looks at my mom, and he goes, seen any dogs lately? <laughs> I don't think that's what he had in mind, but my dad was actually trying. <laughs> so, anyway. But if anybody was a survivor, my dad was a survivor. And you read about them all the time. People that have just insurmountable odds overcame. And I believe that what, what God was basically saying is that these people that overcame, there was, there's no anointing. There's no redemption if they're unsaved. They're unsaved. But somehow they learn to let go and keep on going. Letting go is key, and the believer has that capacity. The believer has that capacity to learn to let go. And when you let go properly, there is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that basically begins to move. But I want to tell you something. In... These, these survivors, they somehow they seem unscathed, but in reality there's no redemption in it. They learn to cope. And Christians can do that too by mistake. They can rather than live in a supernatural exchange that really is a changed life, they can learn to cope with willpower. One of the saddest things for me, uh, primarily because of discernment being so automatic, in my life. I was, as a very young uh, pastor, um, an advisor for um, a women's meeting that would have guest speakers come in and all they did was share their testimony. And I, my heart would just ache inside because a lot of them were sharing testimonies that were not a testimony yet. And thank God they coped because most of their stories were survivor stories of being in a difficult situation with a long-term sickness or disease with a loved one and how they overcame. But they're crying while they're talking and they're hurting. Not just crying. You can cry joyful tears. But they were hurting while they're talking and I, it would just grieve me. Because I wanted to go up and pray for them and show them how to let Jesus take that pain and that sorrow. They coped just like the world. They were sincere, and thank God they did overcome. But that's not a supernatural work of the Spirit. And so I want to make sure that we understand today that we want to be those who overcome by the Spirit of God, and that there is a transformation and an internal no-so. Uh, in Acts 19... It says, now God worked unusual miracles in Ephesus by the hands of Paul. Diseases left them. Evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you in, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there was seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirits answered and said... Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? <laughs> you is a key word in the body of Christ. You, I've watched, I've sat in pastor's meetings where an Assemblies of God and a Faith Camp pastor argued over the word you. They were both right, but they're using the word you differently. Apart from him, you can do nothing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, the you is significant to be understood from the point of the recreated human spirit, that spirit of yours that's mingled together with Jesus into something that is brand new. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. Okay? So, the power of God flows from the spirit through our spirit. And in Mark, I thought it was interesting, Mark chapter 2, verses 3 to 12, they talk about the paralytic, you remember, who they basically carried by four men when they couldn't get near him because of the crowd, they, they basically uncovered the roof where he was, 
broke down through, let him down on a bed. The paralytic was lying. Then Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he discerned, he discerned the Pharisees. By the way, in the church, we don't like to name names, but I'll tell you what, if you think you already know something, if you're prone to say, I already know that, I've already taken a course, I've already known that, you're, you could be leaning toward a pharisaical attitude because that, make, that renders you unteachable. There's nothing that I've ever known that I can't know at a deeper level and that revelation can't increase intrinsically to a greater and larger dimension. It's the dimension of Jesus internally that we need to grow into. But listen, he says, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins except God alone? He was declaring that he was the son of God, wasn't he? Your sins are forgiven. Now, isn't it interesting? They weren't arguing about the healing. The blasphemy was that your sins are forgiven. So Jesus Knowing, he says, uh, so which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or take up your bed and walk? Obviously, we know it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than take up your bed and walk from an external point of view, right? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Only God can forgive sin. But where is God? Point to him. Yeah, nobody in this congregation does this. When we traveled, 98% of the church did this. Stop it, Tom. I saw that hand. All right. It's Christ in you. So, not to name names there in the back row. But... <laughs> Where's Jesus? Come on, point. There you go. Radical transformation. Radical transformation. What a healthy group. You are God indwelt people. God inside minded. I like that. Now, uh, when God works in us through us by the recreated human spirit, look at this word you. If you don't understand this you, if you don't see yourself as God infused, God inside, joined together with the Lord, I'm a new creation, something that never existed before, before salvation, never existed. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. We need more believers to talk like that. I of my own self can do nothing. You know, you're never going to stop being a self. But it's a question of who is ruling that self. Is it functioning independently or is it functioning apart? Now, John 5, 19 says, The Son can do nothing of, a, of Himself but what He sees the Father do. Without Me, you can do nothing. But then it says, For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. Where is He at? And it is God who is at work to will and to perform. Hmm. Many people have even developed the theology that forgiveness is hard. Most of the time that came about by their experience, not by the Word of God. Because they struggled with a concept like forgiveness because like those survivors, even as a believer, you can say, mind, I forgive as an act of my will. That's the wrong you, forgiving. And then when the pain is still there, what do you do? You try again. I try to forgive again and again. When I married Jennifer, she basically said, I've been trying to forgive this person for a year now. I was appalled. A year trying to forgive someone? Aren't you glad to receive his forgiveness at salvation? You didn't wait a year? Huh? It was a gift, wasn't it? I want to go slow with this because I want you to really understand that I believe we have to go back here for one reason. God named the ministry and he 
emphasized what my calling was to Timothy 1.11. You're called to be a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. And I didn't even know what a Gentile was, but I knew I was supposed to be a preacher to the body at large. And God basically said, in that calling, your emphasis will be maturity. Therein lies the umbrella uh, ministry over Kingdom Life Church and the school and all this full stature ministry. The emphasis is not baby food. The emphasis is to provoke you unto love and good deeds and to move to another level of intimacy with God. And here's the part that kind of, kind of the reason that I was kind of surprised when we did traveling ministry. You see, when I pastored for probably 10 years without going anywhere, occasionally, but without going into a traveling ministry to see what it was like outside of my own fellowship, you get a better perspective of what's going on. And when I went out, I want to teach full stature stuff. I wanted to teach levels of maturity. And I found out that people didn't even know how to forgive. And my criteria is like John's criteria. I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And I saw people didn't know how to forgive. And for me that was, I speak to you little children. I speak to you young men because you're basically walking in a replaced life. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives. And the Word of God, head to toe, abides. I'm an abider, not a touch from God, but an abiding presence. He abides in me, and the Word of God abides in me, and I've overcome the wicked one. I walk in a victorious Christian life, moment by moment, and abiding is not a foreign element. I speak to you fathers, because basically you're, you're sold out, others oriented, and you want to bring sons to glory as your primary focus. It's not about you, your ministry. It's about your sons and daughters and bringing them to the place of maturity. You, you know, you're not a son just because you're born. A son is one who is, has the maturity to take over the father's business. It should be father and son incorporated in the kingdom of God. It really should be. Sons and daughters need to be able to take over the family business. That's adoption from that concept. If you can't take over the father's business, what I see in the church, the weakness at the young man stage is still a false independence. Oh, it's just me and God, just me and God. I don't need other people's opinion. What it really means is you're not mature enough to be interdependent. So let's get back down to the child level where I believe all of the church could glean. And that is forgiveness. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. People walking around tell me they're rejected. Oh, give me a break. If you were walking on a forgiveness lifestyle, if you really walked in a redemptive understanding of it, you wouldn't be walking around in rejection. Rejection would be a foreign element to you. Because if someone rejected you, you went, oh, I would have loved on you anyway. That should be the gut response, not, oh, poor me, they hurt my feelings. 67% of people that leave a church and go to another church were offended. And usually they don't talk about it, they just get offended and move. That's not even a child from John's concept. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. You have, you're walking in a forgiveness lifestyle. You don't just know how to do it. All right? So, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit mingles with our human spirit called a new creation. Right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Okay? That means that there is a union, and if it doesn't happen down here in your spirit, it didn't happen. I heard Benny Hinn say this once, and people were shocked by it. I don't know exactly what he's talking about. He said, the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. Well, there's nothing deep about that. These seven sons of Sceva found out the name of Jesus didn't work, didn't they? <laughs> but you know, even as a believer, you can do stuff in the flesh. You can try to forgive in the flesh and then wonder why it's not working and blame God, the preacher, the Bible, the blame game. The Holy Spirit mingles. There's a new creation. And if properly understood, there's no separation. He doesn't leave you. You have to operate independently of Him. 
you have to step out in the me, myself, and I attitude and do things in the flesh. If <clears throat> you received salvation, and here's the way that we tried to explain it in the simplest terms possible. When you got born again, you put off the old man. Say off. O-F-F. -F. You can remember this. You can take this home. You don't have to take notes. You'll never forget it. I put off the old man. How did I put off the old man? Whether you knew it or not. And here's the other thing. This is the door of the heart here. He didn't stand at your door of your head and knock and say, can I come in? <laughs> did he? <coughs> Your head was going, oh, I don't need Jesus. I don't need this religious stuff. I don't need it. That's good for them, not for... Huh? That's what the head does. But whether you knew it or not, at that point in time, you opened your heart. Oh. This is OFF. -F. This is not going to be complicated. Opened your heart, whether you knew you did it or not. You opened your heart. You received forgiveness, and it didn't take a year. It wasn't a struggle. It was a gift. By grace, through faith, it's a gift, right? Open forgiveness. Now, I want that forgiveness to be supernatural. Otherwise, it's a mental concept. I don't want to cope. I want to change life. So if when I got saved, I opened, received forgiveness, how did I know? Peace. Peace with God. Peace with one another. I started getting loving thoughts, scared me half to death. I started thinking nice thoughts. <laughs> I knew that didn't come from here. It went like this. The next F was fruit. There was evidence of a supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange. And from that point on, I only understood the Christian walk in the context of OFF. -F. If it didn't, if I wasn't open here, and if I didn't have the fruit of peace, I was no longer under the rule of God. Somehow, I was separate. Sin is separation from God. The only legitimate wall that I could have as a believer to practice the presence of God and to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle is peace or joy. But really, peace is love resting and love working, love ruling. When love rules, peace rules. He's the king, and that's the kingdom within. So open, receive forgiveness as a gift, and that's by what? Grace. And we'll get to grace. By grace, and the internal evidence that there was a supernatural exchange was what? Peace, or fruit, genuine fruit of the Spirit. I call them God emotions, the God emotions. It's why he gave us emotions, so that the fruit of the Spirit could be expressed through conduits. Now, I put off the old man. Then, then I see this other verse of Scripture called Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6 says, As you received him, so walk. So, okay, I know how I received him. Now I have to walk the same way. I have to stay open regardless of what's going on in my head, regardless what I'm doing on the job, regardless of levels of contemplation uh, and concentration. On my job, I can keep my heart open and rested in Him. And you will accomplish more with less effort. I taught this to nurses. Because they did it the way of the world. I had emergency room nurses and, and, and uh, 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 ICU nurses in my first pastorate. And they loved it because the supernatural was released on the job then. They learned that in a high pressure situation like an emergency room, they learned the way of the world to suppress or stuff. I cannot feel. I can't get attached to these patients. I can't feel these patients. I don't have time for this. I've got to do my job. 
But then when they got home, there was this decompression because what is suppressed will get expressed later. And they'd come home and they go, I don't want to talk to nobody. I want to turn the television on. Leave me alone. If the phone rings, I'm not answering. That decompression is not necessary. It is not healthy to work with willpower stress all day long. It's bad for your physical body. It's bad for your spiritual well-being. But it, I taught this to one nurse, and she said her first testimony was, after I went to work, and I was up and down like a yo-yo because this takes by reason of use. It takes practice, don't it? You've spent years. You didn't get the way you are today overnight. So it might take a little while to get differently. Practice makes permanent. I know you heard practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. I want to own the spiritual truth. All right. So she went to work and she practiced staying drop down in the midst of the hustle bustle. She found out she accomplished more, but she found out that her sensitivity to the things of the spirit increased. She was, it was not, it was not on her uh, a list to go check room three, but felt in her gut to just go check on room three. Went in, checked three, and caught an emergency in the process of happening. The spiritual sensitivity from the place of peace. From the place of peace, it works like this. Peace is what? Love resting. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your perception of the environment around you. So she learned, just like Jennifer learned, you were like a yo-yo at first. Because it takes practice. You live out of this head your whole life. So you become a Christian. Don't think you're not tempted to live out of this head instead of from the heart. But unless you forgive from the heart. And we literally did a whole circuit of churches teaching them how to forgive. When I wanted to teach full stature, deep truth, and found out I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven and people didn't know how to forgive. I want to make ready a people prepared for an awakening and for the glory of God to come. But by golly, if you don't know how to live the day-by-day -day activity and walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, you're the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people. It needs to be a lifestyle. Because once it's a lifestyle, then you can move into abiding. You have unforgiveness in your heart. You're not abiding in anything except self. And let me give it to you this way. For those that have moved in the gifts of the Spirit, those that are comfortable with the gifts, I'll give you something to show you the simplest way to understand it. Let's say God is giving me a word of knowledge right now. There's three words. If you're a note taker, you need to write this down. Consent. Hmm? Yield and obey. Whether you know it or not, if you were ever used in a word of knowledge or prophecy or any other gift, you did those three things whether you knew it or not. First of all, you have to allow yourself. If a word of knowledge comes up, it can come up so quiet that you could up here dismiss it, couldn't you? Could you dismiss a word of knowledge? Is it possible? Sure it is. You talk yourself out of anything. The carnal, the reasoning mind is good at that. But if you, something floats up, you have to say, I'm going with that. Consent. How do you go with it? Whether you know it or not, you've got to yield to it. You yield and then you obey from the heart. That's not dead works obey. Why? Because when you yield to Him, you are available to grace. Now, I'm going to go slow with this. Here's a definition of grace in this context alone. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do. Oh, so how do I get the power to obey? Do you know, you need grace to obey. Huh? You can't obey without grace. Grace is the ability to obey, to not sin. But where's that coming from? It's coming from your spirit, man. It's coming from the gut, the epicenter, the door. I yield. 
I have to consent. Okay, I'm going to say what I'm getting right now. I've decided in my head that I'm going to say out loud what I'm preaching now. I do it while preaching. I hear stuff. Some stuff gets dismissed and some stuff goes in a different direction. I look at my notes and I don't consent. I go to something that's rising up instead. Consent, but you yield here. Grace is the empowerment to be and to do. Now, if grace is the power to be and to do, when I obey, I am obeying from where? Where am I obeying from? From the heart. Unless you forgive from the heart. If you, don't, if you struggle with forgiveness, you can be forgiving from your head in the flesh. And sincere flesh. And sincerely trying with willpower. But when you consent to forgive and you yield, then the power to obey. This is where Philippians 2.13 actually takes on a manifestation. Philippians 2.13, for those of you who haven't memorized your Bible yet, is, for it is God who is at work both to will and to do. Well, I want God to will and to do, don't you? In me. I want God to will and to perform in me. I have to consent and yield to Him for Him to work. And we went church to church for 12 years, basically teaching something as basic as unless, Matthew 18, unless you forgive from the heart. And everywhere we went, we saw people forgiving from their heads, struggling. Well, I don't know if I want to forgive. I don't want to let them off the hook. They had all these bad definitions of forgiveness, for one thing. And rejection. I, that, I, you can go to any church when we traveled, mention the word rejection, and half the congregation is sobbing with hurts and pains. That should not exist. That was it's painful, I realize that. Jennifer did a study where it says, even in your physical brain, it registers as physical pain. Rejection hurts that bad. That was the initial sin. They were rejected from the garden because of sin. You were rejected from the presence. You were separated. But now, there's no need for that separation. We have that beautiful gift of forgiveness, and he demonstrated that forgiveness toward us by his death on the cross. We should be forgivers. Many people say we should be lovers. But I say forgiveness is where the rubber meets the road. That's loving. It should be others-oriented, selfless, and holy. No takers write those three things down. Dr. Bez, IQ 177, always said, Dennis, you think, you think in grids. And I go, I can't help it. I've been like that my whole life. I have one, two, threes of action, <laughs> and Jennifer totally grabbed it. I never used to speak them, but Jennifer insisted that I go granular and we write this down. Consent, obey, consent, yield, and obey. Does that make it any easier? Who, you're, who, who are you obeying then? Who's the you? Who's the you that's forgiving then? That recreated human spirit, so then you're actually co-laboring with Jesus. What we had to do to get Christians to forgive, we had to say, drop down to your spirit and let the forgiver go to that hurt and through that hurt. I knew if they dropped down from here, the you was the right you. It was that new creation you that was cooperating and it was the Jesus in you, that, the right you, doing the work. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. Raise your hand if that helped. That, did that help the explanation? Because you've read these scriptures and then you don't know what to do with them. So, you could speak in tongues and then you could talk yourself out of it. Where would the talking yourself out of it take place? But what if you consented to speaking in tongues? How would you do it? I would have to first consent. Oh, give it a try. Get out of your comfort zone. I'd have to drop down to my spirit. 
I'd have to yield and then just let it flow. I know it's coming from the right source. Now, you see where my passion is though? I want to bring sons to glory. If we're still little children in the forgiveness realm, my heart just breaks that there's going to be a move of God that's going to bring us the majority of the people. And some of, many of you have entered even in this congregation into the second level where it is no longer I that live. We should even pray that, huh? There's three levels. There's basically of the cross, but it's a work of the cross. You can't skip the work of the cross. The first one's little children, but you're, it's still pretty much me, myself, and I orientated. But you learn to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, get you out of that self, and it gets you to basically move in the direction of toward abiding like the young man. I speak to you, young men, because the Word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the wicked one. The Word in you is strong. And there's many people who think the Word that's in them is strong, but it's all up here. It's not strong until you own it. Am I going slow enough? Okay. I have my coach up in the front row here. When Jesus said in Matthew 10, and he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What he's basically saying is, if you will lose the carnal life of having things your way, and everything is how does this relate to me, myself, and I? And you bar begin, you are gonna, you're going to be pleasantly surprised by an internal satisfaction, but you can't get it in advance. You actually have to do the work of the cross before you find out how wonderful it is. Otherwise, it sounds like, take up my cross, die to my flesh. It sounds so threatening. But if even evil fathers would give you bread and not a stone, how much more would your Heavenly Father give you good things? I think we're limiting ourselves as to the extravagance of our Heavenly Father and how much more He wants to give us the Holy Spirit and give us good things. I want to see eradicated from the church not only a forgiveness lifestyle, but it needs to even start with stop that silly self-condemnation. If your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. He's there to override that self-condemnation. I'm seeing too many people wasting their lives away, beating themselves up. You're playing God. You're not allowed to beat yourself up. You repent and you receive it. It's a gift. You turn, receive the cleansing that you need. Here's the, here's the level I want to go to. I knew I was going to get here. Jennifer's going to shake her head no. But this is my passion. I want to get you beyond this forgiveness thing to where it's so much a part of your life that you're unconsciously competent. Wouldn't you like to be unconsciously competent? <laughs> you're so competent at it, you're unconscious. <laughs> Some of you need to be unconscious to be competent. <laughs> but I want to see it get to the place where to read, how many know you're supposed to read the Word? Okay. And I've watched people struggle in sin. And they were taught to read the Word. So they go like this. I'm having these lustful thoughts about my secretary. Oh, just go read the Word. And then they go read the Word. That's changing the subject. There's no cross in that. That's not the cross. The cross is you deal with that lustful spirit, bring it to death on the cross, and overcome it. Don't just change the subject. We have, we're very clever in the church to avoid pain at all costs by changing the subject. How many people in here suffer rejection? <laughs> Come forward to the altar. Lift up your hands and worship God. Well, when I start lifting up my hands and worshiping God, you change the thought, you change the feeling. I start to feel pretty good. That's not redemption. There's no cross in that. 
You didn't deal with the rejection. You didn't deal with what you're crying about. You're going to go home and cry when you think about it. And then you're, who are you going to get mad at? The church, the word, the preacher, whatever. Right? <laughs> the blame game is over. We've got forgiveness and repentance. The blame game is for the world. Now, here's the three reads. Write this down because this is everything to me. This is where I'm going to take you even if we spend a long time on the foundation. I like foundations too. I'm going to get you to read the word and you're going to read the word feed and drink on that word till you can tell what has life on it and what's just ink on a page. Read till that is commonplace. Secondly, read what's going on on the inside of you that has life and peace. You know what I mean by life? There's, a, there's an inner strength and a want to, not a have to, a want to obey God. There's a want to do something in ministry. There's a want to in ministering to others. There's a want to, and it has life on it, and it's got peace on it. Do it. That's not the same as I want what I want, and I want it now. That's the counterfeit. This is learn to read what's going on inside of you. If you cannot read what's going on inside of you, it's because you're allowing toxic emotions to rule. Toxic emotions separate you from your God. You cannot discern and have a toxic emotion at the same time. That's why I've never paid any attention to church people who go, Sister Jennifer's got a Jezebel spirit <laughs> while they're manifesting. I have no confidence in someone who's manifesting telling me about somebody else. <laughs> the only place you can discern is from the place of Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your perception. You have to have the heart of Jesus before you get the eyes of Jesus. Before you see that through Jesus' eyes, you can't have conflict in here. You got conflict in here, it's coming between you and your God. So, read number one, the Word of God, and look for life. Secondly, look for your internal reaction with life and or peace. Learn to read what's going on inside of you. I've got people, now you know when I discern the human spirit, I'm discerning the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in somebody. And what's amazing to me is I could feel hurt in a person. And I remember, discernment only gets the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in someone else. It's just an impression. And it's mild, accurate, but mild. And the person tells me, I don't know what I feel. I would say that person needs to deepen their intimacy with Jesus and learn to relate their spirit to spirit, breath to breath, life to life. There's something missing when you can't tell what's going on in you. You're living in your head too much if you don't know what's going on in you. So learn to read your Bible and look for the life, but learn to detect that which has life and peace on it, especially in the area of, of doing at work, school, or ministry, those things that have a want to. Those are, it's an indication you need to learn to read the sign of what's going on inside of you, that's a good sign when there's a want to, and it's not selfish want to. It's actually motivated toward others. Then you know you're reading the insides right. Isn't it about loving others? The third kind of reading, and this is my heart of hearts, before I go be with Jesus, I want to see a company of people that enter into this third level of reading to where you are so proficient at reading your environment. In the workplace, in school, in the home, to read the environment. 
realizing, this is like Jennifer's sermon to Dennis, realizing that people and circumstances, and there's nothing else, right? In your environment, of course there's God, but people and circumstances. And this is my passion, that I would walk in First Corinthians, I mean in Colossians 1, I think it's 10 or 11, where it says, being steadfast and patient with joy. You know what that means? That's all of life. Steadfast in circumstances, patient with people, with joy. That's supernatural. How many know you can't do that in the flesh, right? If you're doing that, you're doing it from the Spirit. Trust me, you can't do that in the flesh. But you're reading the environment to such a degree that you have this awesome awareness that God loves you so much that all of these circumstances are to subdue you into the place of remaining in lordship and the joy of his pleasure, doing his will. How do you want me to respond? I, I've done this in one-on-one -on -one sessions for 42 years. I've seen people come in totally frazzled with why, why, why? Oh, stop the why and ask God, how do you want me to respond? Here's the situation. How do I respond? He's not surprised by it. Jennifer never liked my little comments that I made driving, like the guy in front of me going, a green, uh, the light doesn't turn any greener, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I paid for that comment because I was teaching Allison to drive and she picked up my phraseology. She'd come home and her, her mother says, who taught you to talk like that? She goes, Denny. He taught me to drive. Then I got the sermon of all sermons in the kitchen where all good sermons happen. Jennifer says, honey, I was thinking... Right there, I should have known. <laughs> Let the peace guard my heart and my mind because here it comes. I was thinking. It was more than thinking. She goes, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. And I'm going, oh boy. She's on the road stuff. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. And God places those people on the road exactly where he wants to. It's his road. I get it, I get it. I was repenting already. I don't want to hear the rest of the sermon. I'm done. <laughs> we think that we are, I think as believers we have a jurisdiction problem. Like the Lord spoke to me very clearly at Publix. I didn't like the people that didn't go up and down the right aisles where the arrows were pointing. <laughs> I'm going, how big does that arrow have to be before you go? And God said, who made you king of the public's parking lot? And I'll tell you what, I needed it at that time. Because we have a tendency to know how everybody else should act. Right? And those carts, those people that never bring their carts back. I had to repent about all these people. I don't even know who these people are. But they leave them parked so they can scratch cars because they're too lazy to take it up and take it back to where it belongs or put it in the proper uh, place. And I know the attitude, you know, they're there to serve me. I've seen people use waitresses like that, it's despicable. They're not your slaves to be at your beck and call. They're there to do a job, treat them with some respect. As a matter of fact, if you're a believer, you should be the biggest tippers. Huh? Nothing, nothing, no wor worse witness. Well, we're off on a tangent now. Well, I'll get them on this one, huh, John? But I want to see that third level to where you recognize that environment is how do I respond, God? And God will take, he'll take the compost pile of your circumstances and turn into a beautiful garden. He can do, he really can do beauty for ashes. But you've got to let it burn by yielding yourself to him. How many are going to practice consent, yield, obey? And when you're obeying, where are you obeying from? The heart. I've watched too many people burn out trying to obey in the flesh. It doesn't work in the flesh. Matter of fact, we've got 
nine pastors here and I tell them regularly, if it becomes drudgery, quit. I want want to's. If, it's, if it becomes drudgery, there's something wrong in your heart. It's a heart problem. It's not a work problem. There's something wrong. You're not asking the Lord how to respond. It's brought you back into operating outside of yourself. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.